This video is a visualization of Adolf Gallant's last mission, based on Gallant's book, The First and the Last. It's also about JV-44, a special unit of Messerschmitt 262 jet fighters. Gallant was the Luftwaffe General of Fighters for much of the war until his dismissal in January of 1945 following a fighter pilot's revolt. Gallant was an outspoken critic of the Luftwaffe High Command, especially of Goering. Gallant believed the Luftwaffe should focus its late war efforts on opposing Allied bombing and should not waste further production resources on Luftwaffe bombers. He had support from Albert Speer, who steered aircraft production in that direction in risky defiance of orders from Hitler. Gallen believed an advanced weapon like the Me-262 jet, when used as a fighter, might turn the tide against the Allied bombing raids. In his role as General of Fighters, Gallen tried to build a piston-engine fighter reserve away from the Western Front, partly to avoid wasteful ground losses of aircraft and pilots to roving Allied fighter bombers. The reserve was intended to be used against the Allied bombers in a massive blow. The forces Gallant managed to set aside were largely usurped without his knowledge and squandered in Operation Bodenplatte ground attacks, for which Gallant complained the pilots had not been trained. Due to the secrecy involved, not even the German flak gunners were informed of Operation Bodenplatte, resulting in large numbers of unnecessary friendly fire losses. Some of the most experienced fighter pilots, including Lutzow, Steinhoff, Troutloft, Edward Neumann, and Gustav Rodel, were fed up with Goering and organized a meeting to demand Goering's resignation, the fighter pilots' revolt. Gallant was intentionally not present at the meeting for his own protection, but was kept informed real time by phone. Lutzow was the group's spokesman. He did not hold back, expressing the pilots' discontent with Goering. Gehring threatened to have Lutzo and Gallant shot. Gallant was dismissed as general of fighters. He waited around for weeks to see if he'd be executed. Then Hitler intervened. Hitler ordered Gallant to form a new Me-262 unit, separate from the Luftwaffe, where he'd have the opportunity to put his ideas into practice. JV-44 formed around the 22nd of February, 1945. Initially, JV-44 had shared a base with JG-7, which was ordered not to help them in any way. Steinhoff recruited Luftwaffe pilots for JV-44 who were no longer in good standing with Goering or were disgruntled for other reasons. Early JV-44 members included veterans like Lutzow, Gerhard Barkhorn, Graf Kuprinski, Gottfried Fehrmann. Klaus Neumann, who had numerous four-engine bomber kills and others, were unhappy with Steinhoff's replacement at JG-7 and were recruited to JV-44. Less experienced pilots were also recruited. 28 pilots flew to Munich in southern Germany on the 31st of March 1945. At that time, JV-44 had 12 operational jets. Aircraft were shared by the pilots because of the high attrition rate and the jets were hard to maintain, so no personal emblems were displayed on the 262s. With the front line collapsing, Gallant claimed 70 aircraft from different fighter and bomber Geschwaders were transferred to JV-44 in southern Germany just before the 26th of April, the day of his last mission. Gallant wrote that due to the lack of fuel, 262s had to be towed instead of taxied to the takeoff area. Pilots had to move the 262 throttles much more slowly than they were used to, to avoid damaging the engines or stalling. Gallant had visited Novotny's three Gruppe JG-7 base at Achmer around the 8th of November 1944. Even at that earlier date, piston engine fighters were providing cover for the slow acceleration jets during the vulnerable periods when they took off and landed. Gallant formed a similar airfield protection flight for JV-44, led by Lieutenant Heinz Zachsenberg. The Platz Schutz Schwarm started flying in mid-April. It consisted of five FW-190Ds, of which usually no more than two were in the air. 
They occupied the north side of the airport and separated themselves from the jet pilots. The Platschutz swarm provided cover as the ME-262s took off. Protecting the jets as they landed was not mandatory. JV-44 had lost some experienced pilots during the previous week. Six days previous, Johannes Steinhoff crashed his jet on takeoff and was severely burned. Five days before Gallant's last mission, Gerhard Barkhorn flew his last mission. During a landing with a flamed engine and under attack by Mustangs, his open canopy fell on his neck. Two days previous, Gunter Lutzo was killed. Lutzo, like Gallant, was a Spanish Civil War veteran who distinguished himself during his flying career and worked closely with Gallant and the Luftwaffe High Command. They were friends. The pilots took off in Kedas rather than Schwarms, partly because only three ME-262s could fit side by side on a standard German runway, and because of acceleration and maneuverability limitations of the ME-262. As though angels were pushing. The pilots flew in two Kedas. Gallant always led on the missions he flew which took place during the relatively short period between the 16th and the 26th of April. One pilot had to turn back because of engine problems. There may have been a second group of 262s that followed the first six. UNTA officer Edward Schalmoser was a new pilot fresh out of training. After being involved in several collision mishaps, his comrades nicknamed him the Rammer. It seemed to be part humor and part annoyance for the number of jets he lost. Schalmoser first collided with a P-38 that crashed as a result. Afterward, Schalmoser successfully landed a heavily damaged White 5. His second collision involved clipping the propeller of a B-26 he was attacking when his rockets failed to launch. He had looked down to determine if the switch was enabled for the rockets, then looked back up too late. He bailed out and claimed he landed in his mother's garden. This photo of he and his mother that day purportedly confirms this. Despite his injuries, and to the surprise of his colleagues who assumed he'd been killed, Schalmoser kept coming back to fly more missions. JV-44 received R-4M rockets during the last weeks of the war. At first, there weren't enough to go around, and only half of the jets on a mission carried them. On Gallant's last mission, all of the jets were carrying R-4Ms. They were held by underwing wooden racks, as there was a shortage of metal. They were aimed using the normal gun sight, as they had a trajectory similar to the 30mm cannon rounds. They were fired in bursts of six rockets, with up to four bursts. It was not uncommon for pilots to forget the secondary arming of the rockets or for the rockets to malfunction. JV-44 pilots liked them. The following is from Gallant's book, The First and the Last, the English translation. On April 26, I set out on my last mission of the war. I led six jet fighters of the JV-44 against a formation of marauders. Our own little directing post brought us well into contact with the enemy. The weather, varying clouds at different altitudes, with gaps, ground visible in only about three-tenths of the operational area. I sighted the enemy formation in the direction of Neuberg on the Danube. Once again, I noticed how difficult it was, with such great difference of speed, to find the relative flying direction between one's own plane and that of the enemy, and how difficult it was to judge the approach. This difficulty had already driven Lutzo to despair. He had discussed it repeatedly with me, and every time he missed his running, this most successful fighter commodore blamed his own inefficiency as a fighter pilot. Had there been any more need for confirmation as to the hopelessness of operations with the ME-262 by a bomber pilot, our experiences would have sufficed. But now there was no time for such considerations. We were flying in an almost opposite direction to the Marauder formation. Each second meant that we were 300 meters nearer. Close below me, Schalmoser, the jet rammer, whizzed past. In ramming, he made no distinction between friend or foe. The 
B-26s were the 42nd Bomb Wing of the 12th Air Force. They included a group of three French and two U.S. bomb groups, the 320th and the 17th. say that I fought this action ideally, but I led my formation to a fairly favorable firing position. Safety catch off the gun and rocket switch. Already at a great distance, we met with considerable defensive fire. As usual in a dogfight, I was tense and excited. I forgot to release the second safety catch for the rockets. They did not go off. I was in the best firing position. I had aimed accurately and pressed my thumb on the release button with no result maddening for any fighter pilot. Anyhow, my four 30mm cannons were working. They had much more firing power than we had been used to so far. This engagement had lasted only a fraction of a second, a very important second to be sure. One marauder of the last string was on fire and exploded. Now I attacked another bomber in the van of the formation. It was heavily hit as I passed very close above it. During this breakthrough, I got a few minor hits from the defensive fire, but now I wanted to know definitely what was happening to the second bomber I had hit. I was not quite clear if it had crashed. So far, I had not noticed any fighter escort. Above the formation I had attacked last, I banked steeply to the left, and at this moment, it happened. Finnegan said he was escorting Allied bombers when he saw two objects come zipping through the formation and two bombers blew up immediately. I watched the two objects go through the bomber formation and thought that that, that can't be a prop job. It's got to be one of those new Messerschmitt 262 jets. fired off a three-second burst, then hit the throttle on his P-47 and found, I was going so fast I went right through everything and guessed my speed at about 450 plus miles per hour. Finnegan figured he hit one of the German jets, but wasn't sure, so we recorded it as a probable. A hail of fire enveloped me. A Mustang had caught me napping. A sharp rap hit my right knee. The instrument panel with its indispensable instruments was shattered. The right engine was also hit. Its metal covering worked loose in the wind and was partly carried away. Now the left engine was hit too. I could hardly hold her in the air. In this embarrassing situation, I had only one wish, to get out of this crate, which now was apparently only good for dying in. But then I was paralyzed by the terror of being shot while parachuting down. Experience had taught us that we jet fighter pilots had to reckon on this. I soon discovered that my battered ME-262 could be steered again after some adjustments. After a dive through the layer of cloud, I saw the Audubon below me. Ahead of me lay Munich, and to the left, Rheem. A 
few seconds I was over the airfield. It was remarkably quiet and dead below. Having regained my self-confidence, I gave the customary wing wobble and started banking to come in. One engine did not react at all to the throttle. I could not reduce it. Just before the edge of the airfield, I therefore had to cut both engines. A long trail of smoke drifted behind me. Only at this moment I noticed that Thunderbolts and a low-level attack were giving our airfield the works. Now I had no choice. I had not heard the warnings of our ground post because my wireless had faded out when I was hit. There remained only one thing to do, straight down into the fireworks. Touching down, I realized the tire of my nose wheel was flat. It rattled horribly as the earth again received me at a speed of 150 miles per hour on a small landing strip. Break! Break! The kite would not stop! Last, I was out of the kite and into the nearest bomb crater. There were plenty of them on our runways. Bombs and rockets exploded. Bursts of shells from the thunderbolts whistled and banged. A new low-level attack. Out of the fastest fighter in the world and into a bomb crater. That was an utterly wretched feeling. tractor came rushing across to me. It pulled up sharply close by. One of our mechanics. Quickly I got in behind him. He turned and raced off on the shortest route away from the airfield. In silence, I slapped him on the shoulder. He understood better what I wanted to say than any words about the unity between flying and ground personnel could have expressed. The other pilots who took part in this operation were directed to neighboring airfields or came into Reem after the attack. We reported five certain kills without loss to ourselves. I had to go to Munich to a hospital for treatment of my scratched knee. The x-ray showed two splinters in the kneecap. It was put in a plaster, a fine business. Gallant was credited with two victories. The second B-26 Gallant hit managed to return to base, but was so heavily shot up it crashed, killing all on board. Some records show Klaus Neumann with a confirmed kill this day. Other sources claim Schalmoser and Kamadia each shot down an aircraft with rockets on this mission. The U.S. Army Air Force reported four B-26s lost and six more damaged. Two ME-262s were downed, including Gallants, with both pilots surviving. ME-262s were stored along the Autobahn between Munich and Salzburg. Two are shown in this photo. Reportedly, Kettenkrads towed JV-44 ME-262s into the woods around the Munich Rheem airfield for storage. This is the Munich Rheem airport as it appeared in 1945. 
The airport was built in 1939. Munich Ream was bombed by heavy bombers in early April, causing damage on the northeast side of the airport. This photo shows the airport buildings on the north side of the airfield, including the damaged control tower on the right. Note all the debris on the tarmac and the filled-in bomb craters. There's a 262 on the lower right. The pilot dispersal shack was believed to be on the northeast corner of the airfield. There were three heavy flak guns on the southeast side and 12 light AA guns in four positions around the field. Gallant, in a later interview, expressed appreciation and respect for his Oxenberg. The pilots had their aircraft painted with red and white stripes to make them harder for the base flak gunners to misidentify. On April 28th, two days after Gallant's last mission, the 190s moved to Einring, Germany, near the Austrian border. Red 1 was associated with Sachsenberg. He had flown with Steinhoff and JG-52 and had 104 aerial victory claims. Red 13 was associated with Klaus Faba. Faba claimed he shot down one or two P-47s later on the 2nd or 3rd of May, 1945. Judging by the inscriptions on the aircraft, the Platschutzschwarm didn't think the odds for survival were in their favor. Here's a photograph of White 3, the aircraft that Gallant flew that day, along with White 6 at Reim. JV-44 aircraft Gallant flew included White 11 and White 3. Steinhoff seemed to have a preference for White 6. From the book A Higher Call, Franz Stiegler claims to have delivered White 3 to JV-44. That book also describes Gallant taxiing White 3 after it landed with a flat nose wheel. That author describes White 3 as surviving Gallant's last mission, being repaired, and back in service the next day. In later interviews, Gallant had implied he landed with the gear up. In the following interview, Adolf Gallant describes how JV-44 was named. Goering ordered me this formation should not carry my name. Should not be named Jachter, but Gallant. And uh, he asked me, what, what do you propose as name for it? I said, uh, JV-44. JV stands for Yacht Verband 44, two fours, because it was in the end of 44. And I saw I will never get more than four and four, eight planes. And also, as a joke in Germany, uh, a four is a fear. A fear sounds very familiar with Führer. I said, let's now try with two fear. With one fear, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> let's try with two fear. This is a photograph of White 5 and 6. Schallmoser is walking behind the other pilot. White 6 is under the camouflage netting. There are a lot of photographs of White 5. It has the rather plain, all dark green camouflage typical of some early JV-44 aircraft. Schallmoser heavily damaged a White 5 along with destroying White 11. These are B-26s of the 17th Bombardment Group. Most of the paint was removed, leaving bare metal, except for the paint on some of the tails. This photo shows James Finnegan and his crew chief sitting on Finnegan's P-47, or the crew chief's P-47. Finnegan described his aircraft on that mission as having a black nose. The Australian War Memorial has a 262. It was captured by the British after the war. The British painted roundels on it, and in the 50s, the Australians overpainted it. Restorers have removed the added layers of paint, exposing the original camouflage. This may be an original color photo that hasn't been colorized. A few days after this mission, at the end of April, the JV-44 ME-262s were flown from Munich Ream to two primitive airfields in Austria, to Innsbruck and Salzburg. Gallant was negotiating with the U.S. Army Air Force to transfer the remaining 262s under his command in his book, Gallant blames the negotiation failure on couriers who were involved, along with unreasonable American demands to move JV-44. As a result, the ME-262s at Salzburg were blown up on the 4th of May, 1945, by JV-44 personnel who dropped grenades in the engine intakes. 
I've noticed that Gallant changed details of his last mission story in interviews after his book was written. This video reflects the version of Gallant's last mission as written in First in the Last, with some additional details found in books written by Robert Forsyth and Colin Heaton. Hope you enjoyed the video.